uh, welcome those who are watching online. We got a great group of ladies uh, this morning, very talkative, and I hope it translates to questions that you have on Isaiah 22. So if you have your Bible, open to Isaiah 22 in a few moments. We will be reading from the New American Standard Version. And I just have to say, I know I say this every week, this is one of my favorite chapters. I know. I mean, it's extraordinary. And I'm going to give you some background that will help you comprehend and understand. Appreciate Bill Blum being here. Appreciate Jan and Ruth Ann opening up, making the coffee. There's coffee at the back. Um, but we're in for a really good study. If you have to leave, go to work, don't worry about it. Uh, but we'll be done by 8 o'clock. And again, welcome to those watching from all over. And even if you're coming in on the archive, on YouTube, and, and so on, we appreciate uh, your support of our ministry. Who's got the opening prayer today? Love it. It's all yours. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for your blessings in our life. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for the leaders in this uh, Isaiah 22 today. We thank you, Lord, that you would help our ears to be open and help us to hear what you have for us today. Thank you, Lord, that your hand is on the leadership of our nation, that you will control it and guide it, that you will be with us in everything that, that they say and do. Thank you, Lord, for the rain that you're going to provide for us. Thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you provided for us as a nation. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us today. Help us once again to hear and obey what you have for us to say, do and say. In Jesus' name we say, pray, amen. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. Well, oh, yes. I just wanted to mention, there's another week before we go to Israel. Right. Another week here. But I was wondering if y'all would want to get together while we're gone and yeah. do something. You might be thinking about it. Um, maybe have a finger food potluck breakfast mm -hmm. or go out somewhere and meet somewhere or mm -hmm. that's a good idea. Like either yeah. 7 o'clock <laughs> or 10 o'clock. Just yeah. something to think about. We'll talk about it again next week, okay? Yeah, great idea. Great idea. And uh, just for your info, we will meet next week, uh, next Friday, <coughs> and we'll break for two weeks. So y'all may want to get together during that time. As Jean said, she'll be with us in Israel. Those of you watching, it's just a two-week sabbatical. And then we'll come back and pick up and go through uh, the summer. Okay? We'll eventually get to the place where I will have Rochelle teach. She doesn't know that yet. <laughs> uh, late in May, I'm speaking in Houston. Uh, Jackson is leading worship. I'm speaking to... Uh, some businessmen. It's a three-day conference, and uh, so that's when Rochelle will be teaching when Doc. So. All right, Isaiah 22. Here we go. Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem. And Bill, uh, want to go through these fairly quickly. Um, these slides, uh, by way of introduction, and we'll pause toward the end of them of the slides to get your questions. But boy, you really got to understand what I'm showing you on the screen before we start reading. Okay? Isaiah, as we know, was born in 761 B.C., 760 years before the birth of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus. Uh, he was born in Jerusalem, and he was called as a young man to be a prophet to his people the Jews. Um, he is the most well-known prophet uh, of the Hebrew scriptures, and he was older than most of the other prophets. For example, uh, he died long before Daniel and Ezekiel were even born. Um, Isaiah died a martyr. He was sought in half by the king of the Jews um, who didn't like what he was saying to the people. And we'll be coming to that later on. He ministered uh, in Jerusalem. And in a few moments, 
I'm going to show you why Jerusalem is so important because Isaiah 22 is a vision or an oracle that Yahweh gives to Isaiah to deliver to the people who live within the walls of Jerusalem. And it's very applicable to God's people today uh, for those of us who live in Enoch. Remember that the United Kingdom of Israel lasted for 120 <laughs> years. And again, you may get tired of me repeating this, but it's the rule of 70. Once you get this sealed in your mind, the Bible becomes alive to you. So Saul was the first king, then David, then Solomon. Saul began his reign in 1051. Solomon, the third and final king, died in 931. This is called the United Kingdom. Great Britain took this name, the United Kingdom, when they started having colonies, you know, Ireland and other governments under their sovereign rule. So that's where they got the phrase from. The United Kingdom of Israel only lasted 120 years. And then it fell apart, as we have seen. It fell apart because Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who should have been the next king, started raising taxes. Even after his father had taken the wealth of the people and others, uh, for instance, the Tyrians, the people who lived on Tyre, uh, they donated the lumber, or Solomon paid for it, and that lumber was used to build the temple. Well, the people were oppressed with taxes. And Rehoboam comes in and says, okay, you think my father taxed you? Just wait. I'm raising taxes. And, and so when you fill out your tax form every April 15th. <laughs> thank you, Carrie. It's the 18th because of the weekend. You can just remember. That's, that's right. <laughs> Taxes have been the downfall of more countries than you could ever dream, including uh, Israel. So Israel split into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom of Judah had two tribes or two families of the nation of Israel. Judah, the dominant tribe, and Benjamin, the capital, remained Jerusalem. And so you have Isaiah being born in the southern kingdom with his brothers, the northern kingdom having split from the south um, long before Isaiah was even born. He's born in 761. The split occurred in 931. So, you know, what is that? That's 170 years. Uh, that would be like, you know, going back from today into the mid-1800s. Does that make sense? So that kind of gives you perspective. When Isaiah is called to be a prophet, all the visions that he sees, he writes down in scrolls. Um, parchment that you roll up. And of course, Hebrew, you write from right to left. Most likely used a quill and the parchment, a, a, a quill with ink, a dye, if you will. And the parchment was leather. It was a, a veal skin. It was the skin of animals. That would last a long time and he would write his visions down roll it up in a scroll and then they would be read to the people uh, and then these different scrolls were later collated together into what you call the book of isaiah make sense okay so um, the jews typically have recognized that in the book of isaiah there are three major sections. We're in the first section still, 1 through 39. Um, Isaiah, nobody really disputes, he wrote all of the scrolls contained within that first book. Then the second Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, many believe a disciple of Isaiah wrote these scrolls. It's Isaiah 40 through 55. And then Trito Isaiah, the third Isaiah, 56 through 66. Now, this is why remembering these chapters is important. Okay? 1 through 39 deals with the Jews before the fall of Jerusalem 
at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586. Chapters 40 through 55 deals with the Jews during their captivity in Babylon, called the exile, the Babylonian exile that lasted um, or ended in 539. Some people say it lasted 70 years. It's technically, Jeremiah says, the Babylonian kingdom that lasts 70 years. So the Jews were taken into full captivity in 586 and then eventually released in 539 when the Persians defeat the Babylonians. You read about it in Daniel 5. And Cyrus, king of the Persians, allows the Jews and other captives from other nations to go home and rebuild their temples and make sacrifices to their gods on behalf of um, Cyrus, king of the Persians. Uh, and then the last chapter, chapters 56 through 66, deal with the Jews back in Israel rebuilding the temple. As we have seen in our study, we are now in this section of the first book of Isaiah where there are oracles about all the surrounding nations. And man, you've done really well working your way through this. I realize you may not remember everything that we said, but we dealt with Babylon, Assyria, the Philistines, Moab, Syria and Israel in chapter 17, Ethiopia in chapter 18, Egypt, in chapter 19, Egypt and Cush, that's Ethiopia, in chapter 20, Babylon in chapter 21, Edom and Arabia last week. In incredible chapter last week. Now today, we come to Jerusalem. And you have to ask the question, next week we'll come to my newest favorite subject, Tyre. I mean, it's incredible, the king of Tyre, the, 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 the pride of the Tyrians. And, and, and so on. But you have to ask the question, why is this oracle um, about God's people in the middle of the oracles of the nations that surround Jerusalem? So it's a great question. And, and I think the answer to that is because God deals with all the nations, not just his covenant people, but he's the creator of all the nations. And there's an accountability to him. Here's a map of the Assyrian Empire. And remember, I say it over and over, but don't forget it. Assyria is the world's first empire. Before Assyria ascended as an empire, there were kingdoms all over the place. But a kingdom had a king that taxed his own people. An empire is a king that goes beyond his borders with a standing army, conquers other kings and their people, establishes vassal or puppet kings that are loyal to the conquering king, and then the conquering king takes taxes from the people he conquered. Assyria is the world's first empire. And man, they have some great, great kings. We read about them in um, the scriptures. Sargon II, he was the king of Assyria that destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel that wiped out the capital, Samaria, took the Jewish men into captivity, brought in pagan men to intermarry with the Jewish women of the northern kingdom. The men who were taken away are called the ten lost tribes of Israel. The women who remained and were forced to intermarry with pagan men had descendants that the Jews of the south always called half-breeds, Samaritans. And again, when Yeshua comes, he intentionally goes after the least, the littlest, and the lost, the half-breed Samaritans, like the Samaritan woman at the well. And the Jews of the South, of whom Jesus, Yeshua, was a Jew of Judah, though he lived in Galilee. His heritage is in Bethlehem. That's where his parents went to be taxed. Okay, the Jews hated Jews who loved the Samaritans. And never forget, I really think Yahweh measures your love for the least, the littlest, and the lost. And Rochelle, even if it's uh, people who live differently than we, if it's transsexuals, if it's homosexuals, if it's lesbians, you know, I speak truth about their sin, but I love them. They don't think I do, 
because I speak truth. Yeah, but I do because they bear the image of the Creator. Make sense? I, I just wish they'd give me a, a, a chance uh, to show them. This is a great slide here. I wish I had this when I was young. Um, this will really help you. Um, when Sargon II died in 705 BC, his son Sennacherib comes to the throne. And we're going to be reading about Sennacherib in Isaiah 22 today. Sennacherib took the armies and the people that he had conquered and his father had conquered, and he brings them to Jerusalem and surrounds the city, makes all kinds of threats through his major general who stands outside of Jerusalem. You read about it in 2 Chronicles 32, but the oracle, the vision, is about this event in Isaiah 22. The general for Sennacherib stands outside the walls of Jerusalem and all the people are on the walls, they, the men, they come out of their houses and they see 185,000 Assyrian mighty warriors surrounding along with the Elamites and the Persians and other kingdoms that Assyria conquered and had brought their armies with them to demolish Jerusalem. And the general stands out and says, okay, guys, <clears throat> give us your money, open the gates, surrender. And by the way, we're going to see that the treasurer of the temple in Jerusalem, Shebna is his name. He had already made a secret alliance with the king saying, we're going to give you money. Don't worry, don't please. Deal with us gently. Uh, we'll give you whatever you need. And Isaiah finds out about it. And Hezekiah finds out about it. And in this vision, Yahweh says to Isaiah, Isaiah, you replace Shebna with Eliakim. And boy, the judgment on Shebna for not trusting Yahweh and going into an alliance with the king of Assyria. Uh, I mean, we're going to read it. It's chilling. Okay. But this is, this is the vision that we're seeing. Now, the general stood outside the gates and said, open it up, give us your money, or you're going to eat your own feces and drink your own urine. You're going to die of famine. And, and it's hilarious. In 2 Chronicles, I think it's 32. Uh, 2 Chronicles 32, one of the Hebrew leaders um, shouts out in Aramaic, um, hey, would you stop speaking in Hebrew? You're scaring all the men. <laughs> the Bible says the general shouts all the louder in Hebrew. He wants them scared. Well, we're going to see later on, but this is the vision of it. We're going to see that Eliakim and Hezekiah lead the people to repentance, to throw away their trust in walls and chariots and shields, and to trust Yahweh. And in one night, the Assyrian army is wiped out by a plague. And then the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, and those who survived, and there were just a few, they took Shebna back to Assyria with them as a captive. We're going to read about it in this text. So what we see is the great theme of the Old Testament is that the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the unveiling of the glory of Yahweh are typically famine, fear, death, captivity, conflict, war. <coughs> it brings a humbling to people who are not trusting Yahweh. And it repeats over and over and over again. The apocalypse over and over again. Every single nation. And, and so when you read the apocalypse called Revelation, don't make the mistake of thinking that's the end of the world. No, no. It was the end of Roman rule in AD 70, and it was the end of the Jewish nation when they were destroyed in AD 70. It was the apocalypse for them, for their rebellion against the Messiah. But you know what? This kind of stuff continues. Now, here we go. And I'm going to take five minutes because this is really important. This is why Isaiah 22 is so critical. We have to ask ourselves the question, 
Why would Yahweh allow armies to surround Jerusalem and eventually Jerusalem to be destroyed in 586? Now, what we're talking about today, in fact, if you have a pen or a pencil, and I told Doc this before we started, you ought to write the year um, 701 B.C. at the top of Isaiah 22. Because in 701 B.C., you have the fulfillment of the vision that Isaiah is seeing here. Now, when does he see this vision, and when does he write it down? Okay? There's a range of time that it could have happened. It could not have happened before 710 B.C., the vision, the oracle, and it couldn't have happened after 702 B.C. That's the range of when he sees this vision. The fulfillment is 701. You say, wait, how do you know it, it doesn't happen before 710 B.C.? Because the Elamites and the Persians are conquered by the Assyrians in 710 B.C. when the Assyrians destroy Babylon and take the armies. Elam is around Babylon and the Persians are just to the east. They take the people who are not yet mighty. Uh, they're a small tribe, if you will, and they, they absorb them into their army. And we find them right here in 701 B.C. fighting with the Assyrians, and we'll read about it. Now, this is Jerusalem, uh, a drawing, a map, as it would have looked in David's day. Now, today, when we go to Jerusalem and we stand on um, the Mount of Olives, which is across the brook Kidron over here, and it's really tall, you don't get a picture of it, uh, Jerusalem is a little bit in a valley, okay? Except for the temple, which is high. The temple is on what's called Mount Zion. And then the city of David is really low. This spot right here, the, the only freshwater spring in um, all of Jerusalem, in fact, it's up just a little bit, is right here. Interesting little tidbit. When Abraham met Melchizedek in Genesis, you know that incredible story and pays offering? It happened right here. It happened right here. Okay, when we get to Jerusalem, the city has built up all around here. But look at the three valleys. The valley of Gehenna or Hinnom, the trough, the central trough. And then you have the Kidron, Valley and Jesus, the night before he was crucified, walked across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. Now, I'm going to blow your mind a little bit, but it's, for what it's worth, I can prove it. Now's not the time. <laughs> but when Jesus died, I believe he died on the Mount of Olives. And there were, used to be a road that crossed the Kidron that you could look straight into the temple. And that's one of the reasons why they saw the curtain ripped. Because the doors were open and they could see. Now, I'm not alone in my belief in this. This was the traditional Christian belief, but it has long changed. And they're going to take us out to a place when we go to Jerusalem where they say that, that Jesus died and was buried near a bus station. And, and so it's not a big deal. But when we're on the Mount of Olives, I'll show you where I believe Jesus actually uh, was crucified. Okay, so this right here. Looks like a letter in Hebrew. Yeah. What'd you say? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shin. shin. Yeah. Good. Good for you. Bill Shin. Deuteronomy 16. This is in the law. The Pentateuch, the Torah. Yahweh speaking. You shall sacrifice the Passover to Yahweh, your El, your God, from the flock and the herd, in the place where Yahweh chooses to establish his name. In the Jewish state, the Hebrew state, the letter Shin, I'll show it to you here. There it is right there. The letter Shin represents Shaddai, one of the names of God. When you go to a Jewish home, uh, you will see a door knocker outside 
and inside that door knocker, if you will, it's, it's, uh, it's on the doorpost, uh, you'll see the letter Shin, uh, and inside there's a parchment, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our God, God's plural, is singular verb, one. And the idea here is, Israel, there's one God. This is what's called the Shema, the Shema, the, the great teaching of Israel. Monotheism is what we call it. Okay, so remember what Deuteronomy 16, 2 says. You shall offer the Passover on the place where Shaddai, Yahweh, has put his name. Now, whether you believe that or not, the Jews today do, the rabbis, the ancient rabbis believe the valleys in the heart of Jerusalem represent God, his name. Now, this gets really cool. Remember the, the Passover lamb. On the day of Passover, everyone would sacrifice a lamb, one lamb for one family. But the high priest <coughs> would offer one lamb for the nation. And on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, you also had a goat. Okay, so here is a superimposed image of the Temple of Solomon with the Tabernacle of David. The word tabernacle means tent. This is where Yahweh was worshipped during the days of the Jews conquering Israel. When David was king, he looked at this tent and his own palace and he said, it's not appropriate that Yahweh has a tent and I have a palace. Let me build for you, Yahweh, a palace. And Yahweh says, no, you have, you're a man of war, too much blood on your hands, but your son Solomon can. The temple is a replica of the tabernacle, but it's permanent and it's twice the size. So you see how it's superimposed. Now, <clears throat> in England, there was a young man by the name of Isaac Newton. This is his house. And by the way, you remember the story of Isaac Newton being out in his orchard and an apple falling to the ground? Believe it or not, this is the actual apple tree. It's <laughs> over 350 years old. Uh, it's a great place to see. It's about an hour north of Cambridge if you ever go. Uh, to uh, England. Isaac Newton is one of my heroes. I read Newton uh, like I read the newspaper. He studied the temple in Jerusalem. And this is important because of Isaiah 22. Let me say to you what Isaac Newton believed. And I happen to agree with him. Let me show you. This is a drawing of the temple. You say, wait, I, I don't understand how it's drawn. This is the eastern gate. You have the outer court, then you have walls, the world outside the walls. Isaac Newton believed that the pattern of the temple and the tabernacle was given in detail by Yahweh to show how people at war and in conflict and rebellion to him People whose hearts are cold to the Creator can come into fellowship with Yahweh. And here's what Isaac Newton said. He said, when you walked in, here's the altar, there's a brass labor, this is the temple, here's the Ark of the Covenant, this is where the blood of the sacrifice was poured. Isaac Newton believed that this was a timetable for the world. Here's how. This is an actual, I think, one of the most precise renderings of Solomon's temple. And, and uh, if, if uh, we're going to be studying this in Ezekiel 40 through 48 uh, with the men. But notice how high the platform is where the Paschal Lamb was sacrificed. Isaac Newton said this is a symbol of the sun. The sun, and of course, the
the planets revolve around He said it's a symbol of the moon. Twelve oxen bearing the brass labor. When you're getting water to put into smaller labors, the reflection of the fire is seen in the water. And the moon reflects the sun. And what Newton said was, you can know the history of the world through the time that is established in the frame of the temple. I know. I think it's cool. Do you know what Isaac Newton said that the millennium would begin? Not the end of the world. The millennium would begin. Do you know when he said it would begin? Meaning, Yeshua returns to earth an age of peace dawns. People turn their swords into plowshares. He calculated it based upon the measurements of the temple. And he knew the history of the world. Anybody want to take a stab on the year that he said the millennium would begin? And remember, Isaac Newton was born Christmas Day, 1642. And he died in, in 1728. Okay, so 300. Anybody want to take a guess? I'll tell you. 2060. 2060. By the way, I'm going to tell you a passage I was studying last month. The disciples come to Jesus, the apostles do. Yeah. Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? He says, it's not none of your business. Oh, I agree. So, so Isaac Newton could be wrong. Yeah. Quit trying to figure out. I'm, I'm with you. No, I'm with you, Doc. By the way, I agree with that. I will just tell you this. 2020, the world turned upside down. And a generation is 40 years. By the way, that published his, his let, me, let me tell you what they, they believe. Isaac Newton believed that the tree of life is what is needed for life. And that the temple is a replication of how to find the tree of life. You come from the world into the presence of God and live. Um, it's just really fascinating. Now, here's what I want you to see. The first temple was built by Solomon, and we're going to read about an attempt to destroy it in this chapter. It didn't succeed because the people repented and turned to Yahweh. But ultimately, the temple was destroyed. The temple that I showed you here, this temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed in 586 BC, leveled to dust, nothing left. Then when the Jews came back, they came back in 539 and they rebuilt. It's called the second temple. The second temple was not as glorious as the first. This is a, a, a painting from the 19th century representing what's called the second temple. Zerubbabel um, rebuilt it. Then Herod comes along and remodels it. The remodeling of King Herod of the Temple Mount, and, and you'll always know that it's Herod's temple because you have Antonio's fortress, these four things. Solomon's temple would not have had that. And you have the colonnades here. This was Herod's temple. And the disciples were so proud of it. They took Jesus, or, or, or they showed Jesus, said, look at this, this is glorious. And Jesus said, listen, I tell you, not one stone will be left standing upon another. And then he goes across to the Mount of Olives and they follow him. Matthew 24, they say, what do you mean? Not one stone left. And, and then in Matthew 24, he gives a vision of what's going to happen within just 40 years of this temple being destroyed. Now, here's the thing. And I don't know about this. I, I know, Gene, you came up to me before and you said, wait, a preterism or, you know, I don't know. Let me just say this. Isaac Newton and his disciple William Whiston has convinced me of their belief there's a third temple that will be rebuilt by the Jews. And they base that upon Ezekiel 40 through 48 and Isaiah's text scrolls that we'll be coming to. This was a vision, uh, excuse me, a drawing of what William Whiston said the third temple would look like. When will that be built? According to Newton and Whiston, 
that's going to be built for the millennial reign of Christ. My point to you is simply this. The whole point of Scripture is to believe Yahweh, to trust Him, and Yahweh will credit your faith in Him as righteousness. That's the whole point. So, when we come to the judgment on Jerusalem, the place where the temple was built, where He put His name, that He allowed to be destroyed, why? Because the people had stopped. Trusting Him. So the target for us is this. Whatever it is you have in your life that you're putting trust in that is not your Creator, set it aside and trust Yahweh. Okay, I know that was long, but it, you will really, really understand Isaiah 22 as we begin reading because of what I've just explained. Make sense? Any questions or comments? Doc, anything? Well, Mr. Ettinger came to me after your presentation in the men's group and very quietly and humbly said, he's a jeweler, isn't he? I didn't even know who he was. Yeah, he's a jeweler. And he said, in, in America today, we put our trust in comfort. Yes, yes. And I thought that was a very important. Very profound. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Doc. I, I agree with that. Our God is comfort. And we may experience the same kind of judgment. All right, let's begin. Now, I'm just going to read and make commentary as I go. Edith, holler out. If you've got a question or thought, if I'm going too fast, ladies. Uh, but my comments will help you understand. So let's go. The oracle concerning the valley of vision. Circle valley of vision. This is Jerusalem. In the valley, the temple was on the Temple Mount, but the city was down low in the valley. Here's the vision. What is the matter with you now? That you, meaning the people who live in Jerusalem, you have all gone up to the housetops. Now, why would they go up to the housetops? I live right over here when the fireworks on July the 4th. I go up to my roof because I want to see what's happening, right? They go to their housetops. Because they want to see what's happening. The armies are coming to surround the city. Look at this now. You who were full of noise. You boisterous town. You exultant city. Here's the idea. You had it all. You had comfort. You had money. You partied. You celebrated. But yet. Your slain were not slain with the sword. Nor did they die in battle. What does this mean? The siege of Jerusalem by Sennacherib and the armies occurred over several months. They knew they were coming because messengers had sent word. And Hezekiah built a tunnel so that water could come in. But the people began starving. They began starving. Awful, awful stories of the famine in the streets of Jerusalem as the Assyrians siege. And so in this vision, Isaiah is saying, look, you were an exultant, party-going people. Now you're dying, and you're on the housetops looking around asking what's going on. And you didn't die in a battle. You died within the walls. And look at this, verse 3. All your rulers have fled. That means the civil, ecclesiastical, political leaders, they fled the city. Oh, that makes me sick. And they've been captured without bow. What that means is they were so afraid, so scared. They didn't want to be seen with a bow. They'd be an enemy. So they go outside the walls, fleeing Jerusalem, knowing the Assyrians are coming, and they're captured without bow. All of you who were found were taken captive together, though they had fled far away. These are the rulers that fled. Verse 4. Therefore I say this is Isaiah speaking to his people. Isaiah is in the city. Turn your eyes away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to comfort me concerning the destruction of the daughter of my people. By the way, you know what this says? This says if your nation is going down the tubes, 
it's better to weep than it is to scream. Turn away from me. Let me cry. Verse 5. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why he's crying. For Adonai Yahweh of hosts. By the way, in Hebrew, God is Yahweh of armies, correct? Yahweh of armies, meaning he's the guy in control of the Russian army. He's the guy in control of the Ukrainian army. He's the guy in control of the United States army, the Chinese army, the Assyrian <laughs> army. By the way, it's really interesting. You know all those uh, uh, top secret materials that were found? You know, they all said that Ukraine was losing the war. All of them. But yet, on television, all the politicians are saying Ukraine's winning the war. I just, I'll tell you who knows who's actually winning. Yahweh of the armies. All right, let's go on. In the valley of vision. Oh, no. For Yahweh of armies has a day of panic, subjugation, and confusion in the valley of vision. A breaking down of walls and a crying to the mountain. Now, some people say that this text, Isaiah 22, cannot be talking about 701 B.C. and the Assyrian assault on the city of Jerusalem because the walls were never broken down. And they say it can't be that. It's got to be 586 in the Babylonians. No, 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 no. You're going to read later on that what happened was as they saw the Assyrian armies including the Elamites and the Persians and everybody else that the Assyrians had conquered, surrounded Jerusalem. All the old houses inside, they tore them down. They tore down the walls to reinforce the outer walls. So basically you have the city coming down to reinforce the walls. Verse 6, Elam. Elam is a, a, a country, a small tribe of people. Nancy pointed this out. Last week in 710 B.C. when Assyria destroyed Babylon and scattered the Chaldeans. That's a synonym for Babylonians. The Elamites and the Persians wiped out the Chaldeans. So they are partners with Assyria. Elam, because they've been conquered by them, took up the quiver with the chariots and horsemen and Kerr uncovered the shield. Kerr is a city in Persia. So you've got Persians and Elamites under the rule of Sennacherib surrounding Jerusalem. Verse 7. Then your choicest valleys, three of them, full of chariots and the horsemen of Assyria and Elam and Persia took up fixed positions at the gate. And Yahweh, in your Bible it may say he, it's capitalized in your English translation. It is an interpretation here because Yahweh is not in the text. But it's the only one that makes sense. He removed, Yahweh removed the defense of Judah. Because in that day, you depended on the weapons of the house of the forest. Now let me explain to you what the weapons of the house of the forest are. What is the house of the forest? When Solomon was building the temple, he added on to his father's palace, which became his palace. And he added... A foyer where when you walked in, it was this massive foyer where all kinds of people could come in and talk and eat before you would enter into the home of Solomon. This massive foyer is called um, the house of the forest. It's also known as the house of Lebanon. Not because it was in Lebanon. It was in Jerusalem. It was the foyer of King Solomon's house. Why was it called the house of Lebanon? Anybody want to take a guess? Cedar trees. The cedar trees came from Lebanon to build it. And you know what they did? In this foyer, behind walls and upstairs, I mean, it was massively tall. They put their shields. You read about it in the book of Kings and Chronicles. They, they're called targets. Targets are small shields, 200 of those, and then 300 major shields. Now, these shields were basically for your warriors. So they run to the house of the forest. Does that make sense? So here's the deal. Anytime 
trouble ever comes your way, run to Yahweh, not to the house of the forest. That's powerful, isn't it? All right, let's go on. Verse 9. And you saw that the breaches in the wall of the city of David were many, and you collected the waters of the lower pool. Um, in other words, this is why they rebuilt the walls, because they could see the weakness where there were breaches. And they also knew that the water, the, 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 the spring, the only fresh spring that supplied water for Jerusalem was outside the walls. So... King Hezekiah, in the greatest engineering feat in the history of civilization, no joke, built a tunnel. One crew starts on the other one side. In fact, let me put up a map so you can see. One crew starts on one side. The other crew starts on another side. And they start, they start digging. And they meet miraculously uh, in the middle. Oh, yeah, here we go. Perfect. Underground, bedrock, chisels. It is bedrock, by the way. <coughs> Start over here. Started here. You had to bring the water into what's called the Pool of Siloam. You had to bring it in from the fresh spring. They covered up so you couldn't see the spring. Built a water around. And then Hezekiah's tunnel. They met right here. And in, I want to say, 1880-something, they found the rock that they commemorated where the two engineering teams meet. And it's now in a museum in Istanbul, Turkey. They carved out. But here's the deal. Up you know, it does. In, in fact, it's the engineering feat is incredible. Well, this is what that verse is referring to. You collected the waters of the lower pool. <laughs> then you counted the house of Jerusalem. And you tore down the houses to fortify the walls. In other words, those the houses that were already decaying were, were better to be used to fortify the walls than to simply remain in the city. Verse 11. And you made a reservoir between the two walls for the waters of the old pool. By the way, this re reservoir was, was still in existence in the days of Yeshua. They've excavated it, and we'll see it. A lot of things happened at this reservoir, including the blind man uh, that Jesus healed, the beggar, uh, who, who, who there was a tradition because it was such a sacred pool. It saved Jerusalem that, that if you were sick and you were by the pool of Siloam, and the waters moved. An angel was touching the water. And the first person in the pool would be healed. And so Jesus comes along, Yeshua. And there's this blind beggar. And he basically says, hey, how you doing? He says, not well. He says, I'm blind. I can't get to the pool fast enough because I can't see the water rippling. And everybody gets there first. And, and, and Jesus heals him. Right there on the spot. Gives him his sight. He's lame. He begins to walk. He picks up his mat. And then the Pharisees find him and say, what happened to you? Aren't you that blind beggar? Oh, yeah, I don't know what happened to me. All I know is I met a, name, a man named Yeshua from Nazareth, and he healed me. And do you know what the Pharisees were upset about? Healing on the Sabbath. Isn't that crazy? Our religion, rather than looking at a man, it reminds me of the time that Carol Williams gave her life to Christ She's a, a gourmet chef. First time we really met her, she hated Baptists. She was Roman Catholic. They were divorced. She had a restraining order on Kyle. She lifted it so that Kyle and Carol invited us over. This was a quarter of a century ago. And we walk in. Incredible gourmet meal. Oh, man, you smell the French food. And we sit down, and I said, Carol, there was water, and there was tea. I said, for heaven's sake. You can't have a French gourmet meal without a glass of wine. She looked at me and said, I thought you were Baptist. <laughs> I said, well, I am, but what does that have to do with that? I said, Jesus turned the water into wine. I didn't know this. They're wine collectors. We went down the basement. She pulls out wine. And that night, 
She really gave her heart to the Lord fully, and it was the beginning of a reconciliation of marriage. Well, guess what? I wrote about it at the Southern Baptist Convention in 2008. They tried to censor me and remove me from the convention because all they focused on was the bottle of wine. The title of the post was Conversion to Christ Over a Bottle of Wine, and not one person among the 20,000 asked about the woman who had been converted. Okay. Verse 12. Oh, no, here we go, verse 11. You made a reservoir between the two walls for the waters of the old pool, but you did not depend on him... Yahweh, who made the spring. Nor did you take into consideration him who planned it long ago. Oh man, that's beautiful. Verse 12. Therefore, because you didn't trust him or take consideration of him in that day, in that day, 701 BC, when this vision is fulfilled, Yahweh of armies called you to weeping and wailing, to shaving the head and to wearing sackcloth, in ancient days, when you were distressed because you knew your city was about to be destroyed, your family would be taken captive and you might even be killed. You would shave your head and put on sackcloth as an outward sign of your mourning. Look at verse 13. Instead, though, there is gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking wine. What he's saying is this. You should have been regarding Yahweh the entire time. But what you've been doing is trusting in shields and chariots and soldiers and springs and not even thinking about the God who planned it all. And you've been having parties and eating meat and drinking wine and saying to one another, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. But Yahweh of hosts revealed himself to me and said, surely this iniquity shall not be forgiven you until you die, says Adonai, Yahweh of armies. Doesn't that sound like America? Man, let's eat and drink and take comfort. Who cares? We're all going to die anyway. Well, Yahweh says, there's a day of mourning coming. And I tell people, I would much rather repent by the word of God than by the work of God. And yeah, and one of the reasons people aren't repenting today is because they don't know the Word of God. If this text were taught in our schools, all right, I'm getting on my soapbox now. Verse 15. Ooh, we got to finish. Thus says Adonai, Yahweh of armies, come, go to this steward, this is treasurer, the guy who's in charge of the money at the Temple Mount. Shebna is his name. He's in the house of Hezekiah. Look what Shebna does. By the way, Shebna is a picture of the Antichrist. Not one person, the spirit of pride, the spirit of Antichrist. Circle it. Spirit of Antichrist. Proud. Look at what he's done. He's in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here? Whom do you have here? That you, this is what Isaiah is to say to Shebna. You have hewn a tomb for yourself. You have hewn a tomb on the height. You who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. You know what Shevin was doing? The treasure? He's building for himself a tomb among the kings. And basically what he's saying is, look, I'm going to live in Jerusalem until I die. And then I will be buried with pomp and circumstance. People will love me. Behold, Yahweh is about to hurl you headlong, O oh man. He's about to grasp you firmly. Roll you tightly like a ball. To be cast into a vast country, and there you will die. There your splendid chariots will be your shame, your shame of your master's house. I will depose you from your office. I, Yahweh, will pull you down from your station. Oh my goodness. The, 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 the Hebrew poetry here, the imagery, Doc, of, of a ball being rolled up and tossed by Yahweh. Here's what Yahweh is saying in the vision to Isaiah. You go to Shebna and say, look, I know what you've done. You've trusted in your armies. You've trusted in your chariots. You've trusted in your influence. And the Jews in, in their rabbinical liturgy, literature said he'd already made a secret arrangement with Sennacherib to give up the city. Isaiah, go to Shebna and tell him, 
You're going to be cast out. And by the way, the Jews did that. They cast him out. He was deposed of office, and the Assyrians captured him, and they ended up taking him as a captive back to Assyria. Verse 20. Uh, I think yeah. archaeologists have discovered that tomb that yeah. he was building there. Doc, he's, he's exactly right. Shebna's tomb that he was building, they discovered. He wasn't buried there. There's a great picture right there. Spend your whole life trying to die in pomp and circumstance and honor. But if you don't trust Yahweh, you'll be thrown out like a rolling ball. Wow, let's go on. Verse 20. Now we come to Eliakim. By the way, Eliakim, and Doc will forgive me for this, is a beautiful type of Yeshua. He's a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon, verse 20, my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Look at this, verse 21. I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust Eliakim with your authority. He will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. This is Eliakim. By the way, Doc is really good about this. Never ever go past the primary application to the ultimate application 700 years later. Don't bypass the primary. This is about Eliakim. Even though I see him as a shadow and a type of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't forget the application for the Jews is Eliakim. Verse 22. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. That literally happened. Eliakim had the key to the treasury. He shuts it, nobody can open it. He opens it, nobody can shut it. But you know what? It's also a picture of Yeshua. The government shall be on his shoulders. And whatever he opens will remain open and whatever he shuts will be shut. It's a beautiful picture. All right, verse 23. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. His father's house. By the way, when Jesus cleansed the temple in his day, what did he say? What have you done to my father's house? Verse 24. So they will hang him on all the glory of his father's house. They will hang on him, meaning they will give to him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of the vessels from bowls to all the jars. In that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It will even break off and fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut off, for Yahweh has spoken. Basically, that last verse is saying, in that day, when Eliakim takes over, all he will be like a peg driven in the ground. And it is the beginning of repentance and change. And all that Israel, Judah stood for in the past will fall away because, as we'll see coming up in our study of Isaiah, Hezekiah and Eliakim go to the temple. Hezekiah throws himself prostrate before Yahweh and says, we have sinned grievously against you. We have trusted in the forest, uh, the house of the forest, in our target shields, in our chariots, in our walls, and we have partied and played, and we have not listened to you and followed your commandments. Please have mercy on us. And Eliakim does the same thing. Then they come out and say, listen, people, repent. And all the people fall on their face and they repent and say, Yahweh, creator of the world, please forgive us and have mercy. And that very night, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died. And those who survived, including the major generals with Sennacherib, the king, took Shebna, his own sons, when he arrived back capital of Assyria. So here's the point of this chapter. Even though Yahshua, Jerusalem, was the place where God put his name and the Passover lamb died.
died. Even though this is where Yeshua died for the sins of the world, looking in to the tree of life as the curtain split. This city would one day fall in 586 and another day fall in 87. Now the question is, will a new temple one day be rebuilt with Yeshua returning to earth for an age of peace? Here's the deal. Tim Tether would say no. Isaac Newton would say absolutely yes. In fact, Isaac Newton would say that is the thing he is most confident about in all the scripture. I say this, like God, I don't know. What I do know is what everybody teaches and believes. And the more I look at scripture, the one thing I'm certain of is simply this and we'll close. Trust Yahweh and live. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. Does that make sense? Okay. Does it does it help a little bit to understand Isaiah 22? Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, I apologize because that was a long chapter and there was not a lot of discussion. We're out of time. Next week, it'll be a lot easier uh, for Isaiah 23. And we're almost done with the oracles to the nations. And then it gets really really fun okay god bless you have a great week thanks for watching and we'll see you next friday so we will meet next friday you're dismissed